Okay, so uh, good morning everybody. Um, uh, my name is Kenny uh, and uh, together with my partner in crime, uh, Dr. Jonathan Ventura, um, we've been doing a course in uh, design, well, at an integration of design and design anthropology together. Um, and uh, Jonathan, by the way, told me, please speak about the book. So I've mentioned the book. There you go, Jonathan, you can tick that box. What we did during, um, during COVID is that we really couldn't have lessons as we usually have. So we used the time to collect all of the wor work that we've done until now and we're publishing a book. And um, I think that uh, when, we th when we think of the combination between uh, design and design anthropology, for us, it became a question of, and you can, uh, I'm just, if I sort of brief over some of the, uh, of the concepts, uh, you can get it an in-depth uh, explanation in the written work. So I'm not going to go and describe every single concept because it'll take too long. So for instance, what is an, a cultural object Obviously, this is a huge question, and we have explanations in the work. Um, but the question became how, and, and I think this is what I'm, I would like to express to you today, is how can designing cultural objects or reinterpreting cultural objects develop empathetic design or des develop cultural empathy? And um, to be quite honest, I mean, I've seen a lot of people presenting, and everything is so didactic, so I have to come clean. Typically, um, you start out, well, everybody here, it sounds like you started out with a concept, you had a very clear vision of what you wanted to do, and then you went about validating that concept. So, um, my confession is that we had absolutely no clue that this would be the outcome. Uh, in fact, just above, just above our names, there should be serendipity, uh, because serendipity is basically the owner of the outcome of this, as we really it was a co-design effort, and it's something that evolved over time. And, um, and that's more or less the, 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 the overview that I'm going to give. And what, we, what happened uh, in this, uh, with this course is we started off uh, trying to give our students the tools to develop uh, cultural profiles. Our worry was that as, as practitioners, people tend to get lost in budgets and time schedules and so on and so forth, time to market, competitors. We forget to see people. So we developed a course whereby we would be teaching about cultures in the hope that the students would be able to develop a cultural profiles of different cultures and maybe even reinterpret the object. And this is how we started off. Uh, what happened is we slowly realized that a tool for empathetic or cultural empathy and empathetic design was being developed. And what I'm going to do is just to go through the different stages and then uh, uh, sort of briefly the first works and then the last works I'll, I'll sort of give a little bit more detail as to how that came about. So the, the rules of the, of, the, of the course were first of all because it was a comparative research course, we used one material which was wood and then we chose the, the wood cultures that were very uh, uh, predominant, which would be the Japanese um, Edo and Kyoto schools of, of, uh, of joinery together with the culture surrounding, coming from uh, um, sort of a Japanese society, uh, which would be Zen uh, uh, and, and Shinto. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, well, actually the tribes of Sub-Saharan Africa are really, as a South African, I'm worried when people talk about Africa as just one big huge uh, a sort of country, it's not, it's, it's very, very tribal and, and the students have to go and develop knowledge about the tribes and then we threw in uh, the Shakers for good, for, for good faith, um, especially Anne Lee who developed a whole aesthetic around the objects that they were using which were all ritualistic, mostly ritualistic as to working and being honest and so on and so forth and just a little bit of spice, we spoke about um, the American uh, sort of um, Californian coast 60s, 70s and 80s, which became sort of like a hot pot or a melting pot of all the different techniques. The students um, had to reinterpret using technique, using cultural and ritualistic gestures, cultural language, um, material, and um, without denigrating. This is the most important thing. We, we really, it's, it's a thin line between reinterpreting and 
cultural mimicry. And so we were really conscious of that and, and, and maybe even we've made a few transgressions on the way. But we, we, we speak about uh, Edward Said and, and uh, Orientalism and we try and get them to be conscious about not developing a type of a view of cultural mimicry. So the idea is that the students take, start learning these different tribes and, and cultures so on and so forth and then begin to reinterpret them. Just to give a few examples, uh, this would be an inro, which is a, a traditional Japanese uh, um, sort of wallet, which becomes a set for, for um, soldiers to, to, to put on sort of camouflage. Um, and we can see over here, this is a, a sort of like a, a Lego set, which is built in the wabi-sabi uh, um, sort of tradition of how it connects up and everything's uh, a lot looser. So let's just go into a little bit more depth and I'll start describing the projects. Um, on the right over here, we can see um, one of the projects that deals with the um, aesthetics, uh, feminine aesthetics in Japanese society. You can see this is built of eight different layers, which is basically the eight different layers of the kimono and obviously exposes the back of the neck of the Japanese woman, which is supposed to be the most erogenous part of the uh, Japanese woman's body. Um, so going to flip through quickly to the next project. And um, over here, uh, using Tanizaki's book about the praise of shadows, um, what this student did was develop something together with the, the, the influence of Wabi Sabi. So Wabi Sabi speaks about the way things were and human interaction. This is also something that I'd like to uh, speak about is the way that we uh, approached the anthropology of the situation is typically anthropology will be concerned with the behavior of humans within society. What we were interested in was the relationship between society and objects within human behavior. So it's a little bit of a twist, but this is the way that we approach things. So over here, what happens is the use of the drawers expose the back of the, of the drawer, um, of the, there's a back panel behind the drawers, exposes each of the panels to a different type of light according to the time that the draw is open. And with time, the poetic sort of tra uh, translation of how people have been using this, which is speaking about the wabi-sabi and also the shadows, you can actually get an imprint because of the pigments in the, in the, in the wood that change according to the exposure to light. So once again, it's sort of very poetic, it's very nuanced, but, and, and, and this course in a way is for the initiated. So. If anybody has that in their mind, yes, you're right. Um, and of course, speaking about the eternal or ephemeral Kwan, the Zen Kwan, um, this student over here tried to reinterpret this and, and propose a Kwan, but using, together with using a traditional Japanese joinery and using American oak. So the whole idea is when you're using the material, the material becomes part of the code. So we actually seeing layers and layers of coded cultural objects. So here, what he's saying is typically, if this would be in Japanese uh, uh, um, wood from the local Japanese, uh, um, uh, what they have to offer, then we would understand one thing. But here he's talking about something that's much more international. The fact that Zen has broken out and the whole idea of Kwan has become something more international. So we can see already how the layers already are, are being built. Um, this over here is the reinterpretation of a sushi set. And, and over here, what, what this student did was they took the imprint in the marriage basket, the Zulu marriage basket. Um, that's the tribe that Mandela comes from. So he she took the, the uh, imprints on, on these baskets, which ba basically speak about the value of the bride. I'm talking about the real value as in the, the amount of money that was paid, so on and so forth, and the social status. And by re-addressing the, the way that these imprints are done, she started speaking about the problematic, um, I could say, status of women in both Japanese society and in the Zulu society. So already we can see, once again, how these layers are being built and how people are building their messages through these different cultural signs. Um, and... Um, over here, we can see on the left side, these are our kokeshi dolls, Japanese kokeshi dolls, which are actually quite prevalent in Japanese society. And um, they're, they're a very, very standard format. It's a very, very well-known icon. And the idea here 
was to try and translate what we would call the, the ephemeral and the geographical of um, the, the woman, uh, or the way that society sees women and the pressure that society put, put on women to conform to different uh, shapes, so on and so forth. And, the, and what she then developed was sort of like a puzzle where you can put it together in, in a way trying to explain just how everything is so random in a way and how everything develops. And when you're going into Africa, it's even more accented. I mean, you can go to the Sulma tribe where they have these lip plates and the huge lip plates and the tribe next to them will look at those lip plates and the tribe not very many kilometers from there. And, these, and they will look at the lip plate and say, it looks hideous, right? And by the way, the Western researchers that speak about the lip plates talk about the fact that, they want, that the, the tribes use the lip plates because of the slave trade. The only problem is that the Surma were never part of the slave trade. It just has to do with the way that they see their aesthetics. And aesthetics becomes very, very local. So getting to understand that is another uh, sort of factor that we have to take into account. And over here, we're talking about the Akwaba, which is from the Ashanti tribe. And the Ashanti tribe, this Akwaba is basically handed down uh, from mother to daughter. Sorry, I'll put my goggles up there. This is handed down from mother to daughter, and it speaks about fertility. And, and the, the student, Noora, she's a, a very religious uh, a Jewish student, and um, she started developing a message uh, through, these, through this uh, uh, sort of jewelry about the way that the religious community view the, 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 the body of a woman. And her sort of statement was that the body of the woman has now become a machine to produce children. So in, in the religious community, and she's, this is already you can see the way that people are beginning to see themselves differently. And this, I must confess, we had no clue that this is the way things would develop. So that's why I came clean in the beginning, because uh, we, reven, we never really imagined that people from ultra-religious communities, I mean, we've, we've uh, taught people from every community in Israel being ultra-religious, mainstream secular, mainstream uh, religious, um, uh, Israeli Druze, Israeli Arabs, both Christian and Muslim, um, is, is Israeli Ethiopian, you name it, we've taught. And, and the thing is that we've seen this from, from, from student testimony. We've seen this recur and recur and recur. So people begin to see themselves as a tourist in their own culture. They develop an objectivity, which was something that we really couldn't you know, we really didn't know. But I mean, I, and I would like to be able to say it was all planned and we had this whole thing and we just validated. Absolutely not. We really didn't see this coming, which was mo what made this so interesting for us. Because the students became sort of a, a co-research on what could be the outcomes and what could develop. Um, so, um, also for instance, um, the Ikebana. And over here, this was also another religious student. And she was talking about the way that the aesthetics of, of the, the, the Jewish religious aesthetics have become sort of minimized. And what she did was she took the ikebana and she basically baked little chalot, which, which is like the, the ritual Sabbath bread. And she cooked the whole arrangement together with the little rolls in the oven. And they basically developed into petals, which was more or less sort of like speaking about this ephemeral uh, uh, cherry blossom type of thing through the Ikebana. And once again, we can see this different layering and the way people are beginning to experience with their own traditions. And I think that was the most exciting thing, where people started questioning what they had been taught, what they had been brought up in. And this was really, really exciting for us. Um, so, and then also there's a lighter side, um, where we can see one of the students use this sort of African mask uh, tradition to speak about different characters in it was sort of like a Piven. Piven is a character, uh, caricaturist in Israel. And you can see here the masks. We've got Herzl, we've got uh, Ben Gurion, and even Bibi. And the whole idea was you, you sort of imbue these objects and you sort of take it into another, another level. Okay, and once again, it's all about cultural coding and layering. Um, and here I'd like to go a little bit more into depth. Of, um, with, these, uh, with this object. This was done by Noam. Noam was very influenced with uh, the way that seating has to do with 
social strata. And it, there was an incident in Israel some years back where uh, between Turkey and, uh, sorry Naz, between Turkey and, uh, and Israel, and uh, they seated the representative on a lower seat, and I, they thought this was a huge uh, advantage. And, and Noam became really uh, interested in this whole idea of seating and cultural and the heights, the different heights, because Japanese sit, sit at a different height. In Africa, different tribes sit at different heights. Obviously, in Europe, in, in the Western cultures, we sit on different heights. And what he did was he, he tried to develop a message through the, the, the seat of Rietveld. And slowly, as he developed the seat, he realized that there's a whole issue that has to do with, um, with, with I could call it, basic cultures coming from Japan, coming from Africa, that have not been credited. And you just look at what happened in the, the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century, in art, uh, look at music, blues, so on and so forth. And he became obsessed with this whole idea. So what he did was he took the Ritfield chair and he basically broke it down to a Malawi chair, which is this over here. This is the Malawi chief chair. He sits back very low, by the way. If you would look, you, if you'd be looking at a throne or a European uh, leader's chair, it would be very high. Okay? And in Africa, it's different. You're very relaxed, you're laid back, you're not afraid of anything. And he took this Malawi chair and he put it within the frame of the Ritfeld chair. And another thing is that in order to change the message from uh, uh, Ritfeld, he, he basically redesigned the way that the, the things are joined. So if you look at Ritfeld, because Ritfeld was, it was a Eurocentric project, and Ritfeld was talking about the individual within society. And he believed that society is a composition of an individual who is, let's just say, his, his integrity, so to speak, or, ge or geometrical integrity stays whole, but becomes a part of the whole of society. So typically, if you see two members in a piece of furniture by Ritfield, they will be sitting one on each other, like that, okay, without any integration between the parts. What Norm does is he uses Japanese joinery and he integrates. He cuts out the wood and he puts them together. So he's changing the meaning of these members. So when Ritfield does it, he's talking about the individual and the geometric integrity of the individual. When Noam does it, he talks about the fact that the only integrity you get is when you're together with a group, which speaks about Africa, which speaks about Japan. So once again, we can see this layered type of message, the way that the cultural the cultural is being coded into the object. Um, okay, and, and here we'll talk about Noga. Um, Noga speaks about the different levels of, um, of the geisha and the way that the geisha goes through uh, um, the different sort of stages. So the beginning stage would be, uh, let's see if I can use this. Uh, over there, we can see the, the African scarifying. So what happens to, typically, is young, young Zulu brides will be scarified, and that's the, that's the scarification that we'll be seeing. This wood is an African wood, so she's already in the, f in, well, it's actually the second stage of, of the geisha, um, which is the minerai, and, and she's talking about this, uh, basically, connection between the, the, the first stages of the geisha and the first stages of, of the Zulu woman before marriage. Then the next stage over there speaks much more about, you can see the Japanese fan over there using all of Japanese wood. So that would be cherry and that over there would be sort of like the, the, uh, uh, the light wood. Um, it's an areas in Hebrew. Sorry, I forgot for a minute. And, and this is the next stage. And the final stage, which I think is the most important and the most interesting, is when the woman becomes a fully-fledged geisha. And what Noga does over here is she compares them to the shakers. And you can see this because she takes the shaker weaving, which is actually spoke-shaven wood. It's not weaving of, of, of grass, so on and so forth. But you can see these joins over here, right, which make them into what we would say uh, a, a true statement. And finally, um, 
this project over here, which basically speaks about, her name is Miki Otolengi, and what she did was she took this, the rite of passage, of, of coming of age, of, uh, of young people who in the Jewish tradition put on tefillin, and in the, the Lwalwa tribe, they basically go through this whole thing of mosques and so on and so forth, and she connected up these two cultures. And what we can see from this connection, because she was brought up in totally religious tradition where graven image is absolutely a sacrilege, and this is what we get in the end, which shows us the level of, of introvert type of thinking and, and revaluation of our own cultures. So I think that, just to sum up, if we're looking forward as what, at what's happening in the economy, society, so on and so forth, Designers cannot afford just to stand aside anymore. We really, really have to be part of what's going on in society, which means that to be a blessing, maybe we should stick together and start seeing people through design anthropology. Thank you very, very much.